Okay, so I'm going to give my reflections on involvement in IPCC Fifth Assessment Report Working Group 1. Um, so what was my role in, in Fifth Assessment Report? I was a lead author on Chapter 2 in Working Group 1. I was a contributing author to both the summary for policymakers and the technical summary. I was also a contributing author to chapters 9 and 10, and also, belatedly, I became a contributing author to a working group 2 cross-chapter box. So I did quite a lot in AR5. So getting nominated varies hugely on a national basis. Some countries tap you on the shoulder and say you're nominated. Other countries go with a fully open, publicly advertised nomination process. Um, Colin gave the process here. I would urge you, if you are interested, to at least make your interest known to Colin, which reports, which working groups, if you're going for the full AR6 experience, you are most interested in participating in. So in my case, I was, I was at the time in the UK, although if you look at my AR5 um, not author nationality listing, it says UK slash USA slash Norway. I have a peripatetic existence as a scientist. Um, so the UK had looked through all of their, they had an open nomination process and they looked through all their nominations and they said, we have no one in observations we actually wish to put forward. So two days before I moved to America, as I was cleaning my desk at the Met Office, I got called by top civil servants in the Department for Energy and Climate Change. We need someone on observations. We know you're packing your desk and leaving. Can we put you forward anyway? Quick call to, to Noah in the US. Yes, you can be put forward. So that's how I got involved. I didn't actually self-nominate. Um, so the, all these nominations go in, as was said. The parties decide there were way more nominations than there are acceptances. So if you don't get accepted, don't worry, it's nothing personal. OK. Um, but if invited forwards, you have this really strange thing where you're invited forwards, but they say, we're not allowed to tell you who else is on your chapter, which is a really weird way of doing it. If you're a coordinating lead author, you actually get to see who's proposed for the chapter and you get to have a say whether you really have a personal conflict of interest with any of these people that would preclude their availability on the chapter. But if you're a common garden lead author, you have no option. You just say yes or no, and then they say, ah, oh, here's the rest of your team. Um, so a chapter team is made up of two, or in my case, on a special exemption, there were three coordinating lead authors, and they're coordinating the entire chapter. And then there are somewhere between about 8 and 12 lead authors. And that's your core team for your chapter. And your really primary concern is your chapter. That's the only thing that at the end of the day matters to you. If you are invited forwards, you will be expected to commit to the drafting and to attending the four lead author meetings. And there will always be four lead author meetings. Be prepared to travel. Okay, for AR5, we went first to Kunming, China, which is actually closer to India than Beijing. So you fly into Beijing and then you fly for another five hours. Then we went to France and did we go to Paris? No, we went to Brest. Then we went to Marrakesh in Morocco and then someone said it's in Australia and there was a little, little, a little betting ring going around the lead author team given how far from capital cities we've gone. We didn't think it would be Sydney or Melbourne. It was even monies between Darwin and Hobart and Hobart came out winning. Um, that took me 60 hours to get to. Okay, and then Stockholm, Sweden was for the final approval session. So I think it is, if you're going to nominate, you do need to have the commitment of someone willing to support that travel financially. Okay, there is no way that you as an author could self-fund that degree of travel over two, three years. So someone needs to have the money to stump the travel cash. We're not talking here a massive per diem, we're talking an airfare and a and actual costs, the normal Irish way of doing things. 
So what happens? Let's go through chronologically the first lead author's meeting. This is where you all just land. And it's the first time you really meet many of your chapters. So I knew beforehand just over half of my chapter. I knew those individually. The rest were unknown to me. And I would say that was not atypical of how you would know. So you land, and you're doing the whole Foreman, Norman, etc. in that week. And you were given what came from the scoping meeting, the chapter scope, which is a list of maybe 15 or 20 bullets. And it's your job during that week, basically, as a chapter team, to alight on your initial chapter structure that is responsive to that charge. You've got to agree an intended modus operandi for the chapter team. You've got to also think about nominating a coordinating lead author and lead author for the technical summary and summary for policymakers drafting team. And then you need to think about, well, the reality is that if you have 10 to 14 members of a chapter team, you will not cover with the necessary depth of expertise every aspect of that chapter. So you need to identify where you're weak and you need to identify who you're going to ask to help fill those gaps. So that's where the contributing authors come in. Basically, the author teams go, I can cover this bit of the chapter, but I need help here. So um, my colleague from X knows a lot about this. We're going to ask them to produce 600 words. And I'm going to take that and address and build that into the chapter. You also are discussing with other chapters, so quite, there's quite a lot of where's the boundary going on? Who's doing what? In the weeks that follow, you draft a zero order draft. So this is really your first effort to get some words on paper. And you're going to ask two or three people here to give you friendly reviews. Okay, so these are people that you know are not going to rip you to shreds, that are going to be constructive, that are going to tell you where the gaps are, give you real in-depth review on structure, continuity, a whole bunch of things. So you come away from the first lead authors meeting thinking, okay, there's quite a lot of work still to do, it's quite a lot of work to do. So you've gone through this, you've drafted, you've got the reviews back from your friendly reviewers, and you're going to the second lead authors meeting. And here you're going to discuss critically the zero order draft. You're going to reflect on those informal reviews. You're going to start more seriously discussing the cross-chapter issues. So very rarely are there clean breaks between chapters. You want to assure that you are not covering the same thing multiple times in the report, but equally, you want to assure yourselves that you are not letting things fall between cracks because two chapters think each other are doing something and neither of you are doing it. So you really need to start thinking about this cross-chapter issue. You agree the new change is required, and then you draft the first order draft. And this is the first one that is going to be seen publicly. So this can't have we're going to put a lot of text here, dot, 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 highlighted in yellow. Okay, this needs to be a substantively complete draft. Now, in working group one, which is what I was in, this is a real challenge for the latter chapters that are dependent upon the models. Because there is a phasing issue, and this comes back to a question that was asked earlier about the timing. There is a real challenge for the model-based chapters in that the model runs typically at this point are just being completed for the, net, for the newest coupled model into comparison project runs. So there is no literature. You're assessing old literature, but you know you're going to almost certainly replace all of that literature with new literature that's going to appear over the next 12 months arising from the latest model into comparison project. So there are challenges that are working group specific and maybe sectorially specific. So in working group one, the observations chapters, the one that I was in, are challenged in this way. But all of them that depend upon the model runs, they know they're going to completely have to redraft between that first order draft and the final draft. 
because all of the model runs will come in and all of the analyses will come in. So that first order draft goes out for expert review and I use expert here in that way because anyone can self-nominate as an expert. There is no entry level to expertise. There is no, please prove you have drafted, you have written five peer-reviewed papers or whatever. Arguably, there shouldn't be that. It should be an inclusive process. So there shouldn't be a barrier to nominating yourself as an expert because your view is important. But that expert review goes out onto the wild and anyone can comment. So after the review period closes, you shall receive an Excel file. I would advise you to have a very clear desk <laughs> at that point. Uh, it could contain thousands of review comments, particularly if you're authoring a section that everyone believes they're expert on, like <laughs> surface temperatures, which is the bit I was doing. For my observational temperatures section alone, there were over a thousand review comments. Okay, so I opened this and I got from line, I think, 1,700 to the line 2,800. They were all mine. Um, so I had to actually go through each and every one of those comments and give a substantive response. Now, there are certain things you should avoid in doing reviews. Don't tell me there's a full stop missing. Trust me, 10 other people will do it. And trust me, I'll fix it anyway. Give me a substantive comment. Don't give me an essay that is unsubstantiated. Give me key references. Give me, a little, give me concise constructive reviews, give me suggestions. Don't give me problems, give me solutions. If you want your review comments, if you are reviewing IPCC to be taken seriously, be concise, be constructive, concentrate on the science. And I trust me, peer review, if you take part in IPCC, as a lead author, will never appear troublesome again. You could get a 50-page <laughs> review. It's like, yeah, I'll kick this out today, to be honest. Because you must respond substantively to each and every review comment in here. And that's tough. And I'm sure there were people who reviewed AR5 who looked at my responses and would argue that wasn't a full response to the point. Trust me, it took me two weeks to go through these each time. So the third lead authors are when review editors become involved. So now your chapter team swells by two, three, or four. You discuss the reviews, you discuss the open issues, you discuss your responses. You're meant to have come with your draft responses to reviews there. And the review editors are making sure, they're acting effectively as referees, they're trying to make sure that you have actually taken into consideration adequately the responses or the, the, the requests from expert reviewers. And then you go away and you draft a second order draft. So this is taking into account all of those changes, all the new literature, everything else that's come in, and the second order draft goes to expert and government review. Now, don't be surprised when you go first order draft to second order draft if you completely change your chapter order or anything like that. There were several chapters, including our own, that did that based upon the substantive reviews. So don't be surprised to see a major evolution between that first order draft and the second order draft. So then you go for the fourth and final lead authors meeting and during this time your second order draft has had the expert review and the government review. And you discuss those and you agree final changes required and now it's when the rubber's really hitting the road in terms of cross-chapter collaboration and strange things can happen. Um, so the governments were very strong in AR5 in that second order review that AR5 had to address the hiatus, pause, whatever you want to call it. Our solution, 
after nearly every author sat in a cross-author meeting, even though it was meant to be one from every author team, everyone was interested, was to put this box in chapter nine. And that was really interesting dynamic. That box basically appeared after the second order draft. It didn't get, the box itself did not get peer review. The findings in the SPM got effectively peer review via the plenary, but the box was entirely new. You draft your final chapter and your only remaining changes allowed thereafter really are typos, corrections, and there are some variations that you may require for consistency with the adopted summary for policymakers. But effectively, as the lead author, your job is done at this point. The final plenary are only those authors who were on the drafting team for the technical summary and summary for policymakers and those selected by the technical support unit to attend. So I got invited by the technical support unit because they knew temperatures would be problematic. I got invited to Stockholm even though I hadn't been drafting the technical summary and SPM and added as a contributing author for my sins. But only about 15 to 20% of the authors are going to this final plenary. For most, it's done by this stage. There's two days of preparatory meeting where you're revising the SPM based upon the government reviews of the SPM and agreeing lines and agreeing how you're going to handle the final plenary session as scientists. And then there's five days of intense negotiations. Um, so if you've read the Working Group 1 Summary for Policymakers, you'll have seen a figure two on precipitation. Trust me, I did that on my laptop at 11 o'clock at night. And I also produced the first SPM figure. So two ninths of the SPM figures uh, were produced on my laptop that sat in my rucksack over there. Um, there's lots of time in informal work, informal contact groups particularly if you're unlucky enough to be an early chapter because there's a lot of game theory going on here amongst the participants. There's a lot of setting up minor distractions and setting up groups and moving people across, across the rooms so that some of the smaller delegations don't have an opportunity to participate and Frank's laughing because he knows Ireland is one of the smaller ones. <laughs> You've done this and literally it went 16-hour day, 18-hour day, 20-hour day, 20-hour day, and then four hours later, the media releases up, and you're suddenly, as a scientist, meant to be standing there make, making cogent sense after that many, that long days. It's quite interesting. So that all sounds like a lot of work. And yes, undoubtedly, it is a lot of work if you truly engage in the process. There are passengers. Do not be the passenger. It is not fair on the rest of the author team, and it does not do you any favors. Realistically, you need at the very least flexibility from your employer. Okay? If not some degree of either buyout or task reallocation to allow it. It is nominally a voluntary effort. I would be challenge anyone to be able to do it on top of a full-time job for that period. You do need a degree of facilitation, undoubtedly. But there are upsides. So several of my recent papers directly resulted from my involvement in AR5. I have a much greater deeper network of international contacts which enables greater collaboration. If I have a problem, I know who I can email to get help. It is an enormous benefit to you in the long term to have that massively increased Rolodex of contacts. Undoubtedly, it helps create a more rounded personal knowledge base. You have to confront moving outside your area of immediate expertise if you're going to do the assessment properly. And it's an assessment, it's not a review. It is a very distinct problem. It requires in-depth knowledge. It requires making those really hard assessment choices. It's not just saying X and Y 2015, Z and A 2016 you have to actually synthesize and assess. It's a real skill. 
And it certainly provides institutional and national cachets. So you should be using that as a carrot back to your employer if they're playing hardball on the time that you would take to do stuff. Some other personal process reflections. The assessment is by authors from primarily by authors from countries who can do their own anyway. And this really struck me in the final plenary when all of the tropical sites said your rainfall data, your rainfall assessment doesn't help us. We need rainfall, wet season start date, cessation date, break frequency, intensity. You don't provide that. And they said, IPCC is the only thing we have. We do not have a capability to perform a national assessment. So you have to really think about who this is going to do. Ireland, the UK, the US, most European countries can do their own national assessments and do so. For many countries in the world, IPCC is all they have. And if we don't answer their questions, we're not helping them. There is atrocious gender balance. I remember with shame the applause when they said we have 13% female participation and we're proud of it. Okay, this is not good. The age skew is substantial. When I say the age skew is substantial, I was the youngest participant in AR5. There were only six of us who started AR5 in our 30s. There's a need for better cross-chapter collaboration early in the process. And please, 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 if you're going to be involved, don't be a passenger. They annoy the hell out of everyone. But do recognize differentiated capabilities. If there's someone from Mali, they may not have the capability to do something that some of the other chapter team authors have. So you need to find roles for everyone, and you need to step up to the plate. But equally, if you have a pathological inability to say the word no, I would suggest before you go to the first lead author meeting, standing in front of the mirror and enunciating the word no repeatedly so that you're prepared to say it in that first lead author meeting. Otherwise, you may end up drafting pretty much the entire chapter. So it's about a fair and equitable differentiation of responsibilities within the author team. So conclude, it's hard work, but what you put in fundamentally determines what you get out. It needs a degree of employer flexibility, and it needs some travel funds. And Ireland needs to play, in my view, a full and strong role in AR6 and the special reports. It benefits us strategically in terms of seeking EU funding by building networks and reputation. So if you want to be an FP9, if you want to be an ERC, if you want to be in some of the Copernicus contracts or other things, I think it benefits us enormously. It provides external visibility to our scientists and our science. And it ensures that our voice is heard. There are countries that are severely overrepresented in IPCC, and we need to put forward a strong author cadre, and not all of them will be selected, but having a few Irish across the special reports and across the working groups would be hugely beneficial to us in multiple ways moving forwards. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.